If you brought your Bibles, we will begin in the book of Luke. Luke chapter 6, beginning with verse 46. Luke chapter 6, verse 46. We also will spend some time this morning in Isaiah chapter 28. If you'd like to put a marker in Isaiah 28, you can. But we'll begin with Luke chapter 6. It has been said that heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. Heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. Christ said to his disciples once, he says, I go to prepare a place for you. Right? He said that. He went to prepare a place for his disciples. Those who were following Christ, he went to pre pre prepare a place for you. That place which is prepared is for a prepared people. And if you was to live down here on, on the coast of Texas, which I never have, if you was to spend some considerable time down here, which I never have, someone, uh, there's always concerns. Now, I grew up in Nebraska. In Nebraska, we had some natural disasters. They were called tornadoes. If you've ever seen one or been in one, I have. And it's, it's an experience. However, down here, I am told, one person once told me, Andrew, if you ever live here on the Texas coast, if you ever live here and spend your whole life here, when it comes to hurricanes, it's not a matter of if, but when. This individual told me, he says, of all, if you spend some years down here, it's a considerable amount of time, it is quite likely that in the time of your life living here, you will be exposed to the storm called a hurricane. And you need to be prepared. And I tell you, if I would move in tomorrow and you told me that there was a hurricane coming a week from now, you all would begin to make preparations and I would not have no idea what to do. And I would be calling you and saying, hey, this is real. This storm is coming. It's not a matter of if, but when. And when it comes, I want to be prepared. How do I get prepared for the storms that are to come? And so we find in Luke chapter 6, Christ speaking his words. And in the simplicity of his truth, he says in verse 46, And why call me Lord, Lord, and you do not do the things which I say? Why do you call me Lord if you're not going to do what I say? Whosoever cometh to me, and heareth my sayings, and doeth them, I will shew you, or show you, to whom he is like. So when Christ is speaking, in, if you have the King James Version, you find these words that end in E-T-H. And I always grasp those words. Anytime I see the E-T-H at the end of a word, more than likely, almost all the time, that is in the present active tense. It's happening now and continuing to happen. So Christ is speaking. He says, if you are coming, if you're coming to me, if you're hearing me, if you're doing the things that I'm saying, I'll show you what that's like. He is like a man which built a house and digged deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. But he that heareth and doeth not. So you're hearing the things, but you're not doing anything about it. When you hear the things, but you don't do it, that is like the man that without a foundation built a house upon the earth. You built it on the dirt, okay? Not the rock, but the dirt, the sand. Against which, when the stream did beat vehemently, immediately, right away, it fell. And the ruin, 
of that house was great. It was awful, a horrible sight, something that you would not want to happen to you or any other. In this passage of text, we hear these words, hear and do, dig and build. And notice in this account, although there's a similar account in the book of Matthew, in this account of Luke, we find a little more insight. Not only does this man who hears and does the things of Christ, it says that he goes, and when he's looking for a place, he digs until he gets to the rock to build his house. Now, although I haven't lived here I live in the Texas Hill Country, and I don't know if you notice, but in the Texas Hill Country, every time it rains, it rains upon rocks, and I think the rocks grow and multiply. I don't know if you've ever seen this. That's what seems to be happening in our backyard. It rains, there's more rocks. It rains, there's more rocks. Uh, years ago, when we were in our first house in the Texas Hill Country, we were uh, doing a little landscaping, and so my goal was to go out into the yard, and it was to pluck up or remove some of the rocks so I could get my yard to grow, okay? So as I'm walking around with a pry bar and a shovel, I find a small rock, about that big. And I take my shovel on the side of that rock, begin to pry it open, and I realize I hit more of the rock only to take the shovel and dig away some of the dirt and the natural grass of the area and the rock starts to grow. Only to dig more and the rock starts to grow. Only to dig more and the rock starts to grow. Now suddenly it's no longer landscaping. I am fascinated by this one rock that I begin to dig and as I dig around and uncover the earth, I find it seems like this rock is the size of a car. And I think no better place to build a house than on a rock such as this. But interesting, the one who hears and does the things of Christ digs. Why must we dig to get to the rock? Because the things of the earth is not the place where you build. You remove the earth. So Christ is saying, if there are things of this earth that are getting between your foundation and the rock of Christ, you dig it up. You get rid of it. The foundation is the rock, and the things of this earth must not get in between those two things. So we must hear and do, dig and build. And when we build, it is not with the intent just to lay the foundation, but it is to complete and to continue to build upon that foundation of Christ. Luke 14, verse 29 says, Lest happily, or happily, excuse me, after he's laid the foundation, he's not able to finish it. If he doesn't finish it, behold, all those that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build, but he was not able to finish. He started, but he didn't finish. Speaking of foundations, 1 Timothy 6.19 says, Laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may hold, lay hold of eternal life. It is wise to store up on a good foundation and to build upon because it's not if the storms will come, it's when. 2 Timothy 2.19 says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. So God's foundation is presently actively standing it is sure, it is solid. You do not have to question it one bit. The foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And it says, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. God's message that he spoke says anyone that's naming the name of Christ, if you say Christ is, Christ is Lord of my life, Christ is whom I serve, he says if you are presently and actively naming that in your life, he says you will depart from iniquity. And that may be something that is foreign to the ears of the people of this world. 
to think that you could name the name of Christ and you could depart, be rid of iniquity or sin. And yet we find it in his word. Other translations also emphasize this word. This, this word depart is a verb in the imperative sense. What does that mean? It is a command. It is expressing a command to the hearer, those who hear it, to perform or do. So hear and do. The command is to hear and then perform a certain action by the order and the authority of the one giving the command. So it's not me in my own strength that says, I will stop sinning. It's no, God has given me an imperative command that says, if you claim my name, you will depart from iniquity. It's not in your own strength, Andrew, but it comes from the authority and the power of the one who gave the command. That is truth. That is found in his message. That is God speaking, not me. Depart from iniquity, the unrighteousness of heart and life. You can look up any other translation. Standing next to anybody else with their Bible, they may have the NIV version. It would say, must turn away from sin. You could open up the NLT. It would say, must turn away. You could look up the NSA, NASB, and it says, is to keep away from wickedness. You could go to an earlier rendition, the NASB in 1995. It says, abstain from iniquity. You could look at the amplified version that says, stand apart from wickedness and withdraw from wrongdoing. Regardless of the translation, if we seek to know what the truth and the meaning of the scripture is, it says, you will not have any thing to do with iniquity. Is that the message that we hear in the world today? Christ, the only sure foundation, must be found so that we can then begin to build upon the rock. Matthew chapter 16, verses 15 through 18, Christ was speaking and everybody's saying who they thought Christ was as he's coming on to scene and they're like, well, who, some people say he's a prophet, some people maybe say that he's Elijah, and Christ looks at him and in verse 15 he says, but speaking to his disciples, he says, whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. He was naming Christ. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood, no man has revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto you that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What Christ is not saying is, Peter, upon you or your name, I'll build my church. He did not say that. What he is saying is what, what Peter said as a part of his personal testimony. Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Christ says, no man taught you that, but God, my father in heaven, taught you that. And based on that personal testimony, that conviction upon your heart, your life being built on Christ, he'll build his church. And nothing, I mean nothing, shall overpower the church where Christ is the founder and the cornerstone. You have no storm to fear in life, and you have no storm today or in any day in your future to fear or worry about if Christ is your cornerstone. If you've removed all the things of this earth that could get in the way between you and your personal relationship with Christ and you dig up the earth and you say anything that this world could give me, I'm going to dig it up and be rid of it so that my entire foundation is Christ alone. Not me, not my strength, not my abilities, Christ alone.
Where we build, how we build, who teaches us to build, and with what materials may all be questions that we have. Where we build is upon Christ, the cornerstone. How we build is with the message, his truth, which is taught by his Holy Spirit. Who will build? Those who hear and do. Those who dig and build. Dig and build, hear and do, all that Christ teaches and equips us to do, that is how we build. And with what materials do we build? What is, what is it that you will build with? The message. The totality and completion of the word of God that is taught by the Holy Spirit. Not of men, but of God. That's what you build with. All of it. Not some of it, all of it is important. Acts 20 verse 27 says, For I have not shunned, I didn't shy back or hesitate, I have not shunned to declare to you all the counsel of God. I shared it all with you. I didn't hold back what this message says because it might be inconvenient or because it might be unpopular in the world today, I shared all of it with you. I am not embarrassed. I will not shy back to say what God says through his message. And it continues to give the instructions to the church in verse 28, Acts 20, 28. It says, take heed, therefore, listen, this is what you need to do. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves, you personally, and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers, feed the church, which he purchased with his own blood. The message of God, the entire message, all of truth as revealed by God is vital. It is a matter of life and death. And in the presence of that message in the world today, also in the world today, there are wolves among us seeking to draw disciples away from Christ and trying to draw those disciples to follow after the ideas and teachings of men contrary to the message. We must remember that what we feed grows. I don't know when the last time you may have seen uh, my son Drew, my, my daughter McKenna, my daughter Madeline. Some of you have, may have looked and I've heard this comment that says, wow, you've grown. I think it's because Valerie feeds them. <laughs> what you feed grows. But you know what Valerie will also say? It she'll say, it matters what you feed yourself. What you are putting inside and what you are feeding upon will grow. This is true of desires and temptations. If you feed them, they'll grow. This is also true of the message and the truth of God in your own heart. If you feed upon it, you'll grow. And you may not think that you like something, but when you begin to taste and see that the Lord is good, you will one once experience that this truth is real. This truth is clearly objective truth. I need it. I long for it. I hunger for it. I desire it. It's what I want in my life. It's the message of God. The message, the entire message is essential for building. The manner by which we build is the ascending structure of truth. The ascending structure of truth. If you, have your, you want to turn over to Isaiah chapter 28, if you have a marker there, beginning with verse 7. Let's watch this building process unfold. Let's see how the building happens before our eyes. Verse 7, it says, but they, those were the teachers of that time. 
Isaiah is saying the teachers of that time that we're showing today says they have erred or erred through wine and through strong drink. They're out of the way. The priest and the prophet, they've erred through strong drink. They're swallowed up with wine. They're out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They can't see or perceive the things of God. They stumble in judgment. So how could they possibly present the things of God? And if they err in their way and they're not committed to the message, I tell you, they will not preserve the things of God. And the tables where there should be feasting and banqueting and feeding upon the best food you've ever had. Let me tell you what their, what their tables were filled with. Verse 8, their tables are all full with vomit and filthiness. There is no place clean. The place where they should gather and be fed, where they should gather and grow, there is nothing but paint a picture. God paints it, not me. No food, vomit, and filth. Whom shall teach knowledge? Whom shall make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast, not the babies, but those that are maturing for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people, to whom he said, This is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest. This is the refreshing. Yet they would not hear. Saying the proper way to teach is precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, line upon line. He's saying this would be restful for you. This would be enjoyable for you. This would cause you to rest and enjoy the message of God. But when the message of God was brought before them, you know what they did? They would not hear it. They would not do it. But the word of the Lord was unto them, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. We find two sides of this for those that are seeking the truth of God. God desires to feed you here a little, there a little. Here a little, there a little. Last night I had the opportunity to eat and I thought it was here a lot, there a lot. I was feasting. It was wonderful. This, this abundance of food. And God says, when it comes to my truth, all is important. All of it is vital. But don't try to think that you have to swallow and digest all of it at once. Because he's going to give you just what you need, just when you need it. Here a little, there a little. He'll teach you one thing, and then he'll build upon another. He'll teach you one thing, and then he'll build upon another. And you may be saying, well, what about this? And he says, it's okay. I know you're excited. I love that. But I'm going to teach you one thing and build upon another, one thing and build upon another. And you may be saying, but what about finding the right one? What about Mr. Right? What about getting married? What about having kids? And he says, wait, you're only eight years old. Slow down. Here a little, there a little, here a little, there a little. I tell McKenna, here a little, there a little, slow down. And God does that with us. And we take comfort in that. That he only gives me what I need, and he'll never give me that beyond which I can handle. Christ told his disciples, he says, oh, there's, there's so many things that I want to share with you, but you're not able to bear them yet. I have peace with that. There's been seasons in my life where I'm like, I, I, know, I want these answers. I want to know. I want to understand how come there's so much here. Lord, I don't know it all. And he says, you don't have to. You just build upon the foundation. You just trust me. I'm going to give you here a little and there a little. Line upon line, we'll build together. We'll grow together. And it'll be so satisfying, so restful. 
His way is the best way. Every time. This is the way that God desires to build the church through his truth. Yes, all of the message is important. But take comfort, have peace, rest. As you hunger for his word, he will reveal it to you here a little, there a little. Line upon line, precept upon precept, the building, pros the building process continues. And in the end times, that which I think and believe that we are in, the Apostle Paul telling the young Timothy who is growing up, beginning his own ministry, Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, he says, Know this, that in the last days perilous times shall come. And it says, keep this. And what's interesting is that word keep, although it does not have the E-T-H ending, that verb is still in the present active tense. So Paul's telling young Timothy, you need to keep knowing this. You need to keep telling yourself this. You need to keep reminding each other of this. Perilous times will come. Keep telling, yeah, we knew this was coming. We knew this was coming. I hear the church saying that. That's okay. There's things going out there. I see it on the news. I hear it on the streets. I see it in my travels. I know that, but God said, keep telling yourself that. That's okay. We knew these storms were coming. But our focus is what we're building upon. Our focus is our foundation. Paul told Timothy, men will be lovers of their own selves. They'll be lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. That's verses 2 and 4. He says in the end times, you'll see the form of godliness, but they'll deny the power thereof in verse 5. He says, you know what? It may look like a church. They may talk with church words. They may even say Christ is the Savior of the world, but there will be parts of that message that they will deny because they don't believe in the authority of the God who commands and gives a direction that says, this is what I'd have you to do. And they say, yeah, you know what? I don't want that truth. I don't want that command. I don't want to follow you in that way. I'll just take the parts and pieces that I think are convenient for me. That's the day in which you live right now. That's what you're going to see when you grow up. That's what you're going to see when you go to work. That's what you're going to see when you go to school, when you go to college, when you travel. There may be people that say, I go to church. It looks like church. They talk about words that I hear in church, but then they strip pieces of God's truth, creating their own message, changing the truth of God into a lie. They are ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. They are saying, have you read this book by this author, this book by this author, and did you know that this is selling, this is the number one on the top 10 New York Times best-selling list? Did you know that this came out? Did you know that this book came out? Did you know that he wrote this book? Did you know I have these conversations? I have these conversations. And every time, you know, I say, I says, you know what I'm reading? You know what I'm enjoying? And I'm not speaking against, if there is a literature out there that clearly communicates the truth of God in accordance with Holy Scripture, Wonderful, but it must be sourced here. And it must not be a source that just makes it convenient and compromises the message of God. Be careful. Be careful. What you hear and the source of the message that's out there today, it needs to be God's truth. Later in that chapter, it says, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, not only deceiving, but they're being deceived themselves. Evil men will wax worse and worse, and they'll not only deceive others, but because they don't possess the truth, they will deceive themselves. 
and seducers, interesting the definition of that word, I cannot do it, but we find the word jugglers. Did you know that? There's evil men, there's jugglers. There's, you know what? There will be people that will, they will be, wow, they, how they can talk and, and maybe it's flashy clothes and maybe it's just the right things and the right appearance. I've been to churches. I've traveled the United States. I've seen the, the fog machines roll in. I've seen the laser light shows. I've heard the music. I've been there. I've traveled to Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I've traveled to Boston. And I love going to see what is the condition. I actually don't love to see it, but I, I go to see what is the condition of the church everywhere that I go. Breaks my heart. Do you come to church for the jugglers to be entertained? Or do you come to feed on the Word of God? Do you long for his message? Is that what's most important in your life? And I find that it, I, I found a verse in scripture from the book of Job that I've never seen before. Job, as you know, was a man that loved God and eschewed evil, right? He loved God, didn't like evil. Funny word, but he loved God, didn't love evil. And then as Satan approaches the heavenly throne, he says, hey, the Lord tells Satan, he says, have you seen my servant Job? Have you seen him? He loves me. And Satan says, you know why he loves you? It's because you put this little hedge around him. It's because you protect him. It's because you give him anything that he wants. That's why he loves you. God says, I'll tell you what, you can have your way with him. You can't take his life. And Job goes through the storms of life. You want to hear about some storms? As this happens, the first storm comes, and the Sabaeans come, and all those servants of Job, there's a group of servants of Job, were slain. This first messenger comes. He says, hey, I just got to let you know those servants over there, they were all killed by this other group that came in, took them over. And before that messenger leaves, a second messenger comes into the, into the room and tells Job, Job, I just want you to know I was out here, and uh, uh, all the sheep that are of your flock, as well as the servants over there, the fire came, and they all died. And before that messenger leaves the room and talk about the bearer of bad news here comes a third messenger he comes in and he says hey uh, it wasn't the Sabaeans but you know what did you know the, Chal the Chaldeans were over here and they came back and you know where you keep all your camels and the caretakers of your camels they came in and they killed all the camels and they killed those servants too and no sooner does that servant even get to leave the room another servant comes in and he says oh you know what your sons and daughters were out eating in your in your second home and while that happened a great wind came up and it killed them all He can't even wait for the first messenger to leave the house or the room before the next one comes in and adds another storm to Job's life. And we find the testimony of Job that says, Job sinned not. Satan approaches God again and he says, oh, just let me have Adam. Just let me have Adam. He'll deny you. And the Lord says, no, he won't. You can't take his life, but have your way with him. And then Job gets boils on his body. He affects his own physical health. And Job stays faithful to God through the storm. And then Job's very own helpmeet, his very own wife. Job's wife says, look at everything that's happened. Why don't you just curse God and go die? His own wife. And Job sins not. And in Job chapter 23, verse 12, we hear the testimony of Job. It says, neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. What God commands, I do. I'm not going to retreat back from what God commands, his lips. He says, Job says, Job 23, verse 12, he says, I have esteemed, or I've placed higher than, I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. The things that God says are more important than the food that I eat day to day. I value his truth more than anything else. It's all about his message. If the storms of life has not, have not visited your front door yet, they will. 
I believe probably for all of us we could give testimony of a storm that's come into our life. And if you think these little ones, if you think that they haven't yet, they will. The storms will come. It's not if, but when. Rain and floods will come. Will you be prepared? Will you hear and do? Will you dig and build? What is the earth? What is it that stands between you and Christ right now? Dig it up. Dig deep. Cast it aside. Uncover the cornerstone and behold Christ for who he is. The more that you learn of Christ, the more that you will cleave to Christ. The more that I tell about her, says, I love my wife, but the more I learn about my wife the more I learn about her the more I love her I think well oh how is it I didn't think I could love you any more than today and I go into the future and once you know it a year passes and I love her more and more and if the same is true about Christ the more we know of Christ the more we shall cleave to it root yourselves into his message bring your roots your roots down into his truth so that when the storms come you will not be washed away we need the message which is the entire counsel of God seek to know it all ask questions about it all at all and don't be overwhelmed because know that the Holy Spirit will teach you here a little and there a little But what if there are gaps in the message of today? I'm almost through for anyone who needs encouragement. What if there are gaps in the message? What if that line upon line, precept upon precept is being built? And what if suddenly someone was to come in, those that are evil, those seducers, those that are out to entertain and make a name for themselves, what if they come and they strip some of that message out? You know what you have is you have gaps. You have gaps between the truth. And in those gaps, either you will not be able to behold Christ and God for who he truly is because pieces are missing, or man will insert his lies to fill the gaps, turning that truth into a lie. We got to be careful. Everything that we hear, everything that we teach, preach, Everything that we believe must be in the message. And if not, then we ask questions, and that's okay. Whether you're four years old, Drew, and you're asking questions the entire car ride here, that's okay. Or you're as old as you think you could ever be. You're 100 years old. Still keep asking questions. Because God will build line upon line, here a little, there a little, and reveal himself to you. In those gaps is deception. That is the slow and subtle change that will be inserted. The truth of God will be changed to a lie. Our message will be an error only to deceive others and become deceived ourselves. We need the entire message to be prepared for the storms to come. Doing some research just on the side, we begin to research uh, students who are going to college. And we find these, uh, these reports that says, of those who are leaving and going to college, 70, 70%, 70 stop attending church regularly. 70. Those who grew up, I'm not talking about those who didn't go to church, those who faithfully grew up and attended church, they leave home, they go to college, 70, 7 out of 10 will stop going. The top five reasons of their replies, I moved to college and I stopped attending. Church members seem judgmental or hypocritical. I don't feel connected to the people in my church. I disagreed with the church's stance on political or social issues. Did you know that all of those could be solved with the right message? Does this truth have hope in it yes does this truth have the love of christ yes does this truth give you answers to questions yes does this truth tell you everything that you want to hear no no this truth tells you everything that you need to hear And when you seek from God what you need to hear, you will begin to feed and rejoice and give thanks 
and say, that's all I want to hear. The last reason of the five, I know I only mentioned four, was my work responsibilities prevented me from attending church. How much do you desire and want and hunger for the message? If you've ever had a job where it prevented you from going to church on a Sunday, I'd love to visit with you. That has happened to me more than once in life. I've, I've worked through that struggle. Hey, we get, we're going to give you a job. You can provide for your family. It's going to require some work on Sundays. I know what that feels like. I know how that wrestles with inside of you. I'd love to visit with you outside of the, uh, this message. When my oldest begins college visits, we talked about it on the way here. This message was prepared before, and I'm just watching it all come to life, and we're talking about college visits. When you begin, if, if college is the path for you, and you begin to prepare for the time of college, there's all kinds of questions, right? Great questions to answer. Hey, what's your major going to be? Okay, yeah, what are you going to major in in college? Sure, why not? Uh, where are you going to live? Yeah, living's pretty important. Uh, where are you going to eat? Are you doing that dining plan that the school offers? Have you ever had their food? Or are you just going to kind of make it on your own with ramen noodles? I told Mal, it might be ramen noodles for you. It might be just the, the most you can afford. You know, there's all these questions as you prepare for college, but the question I'm going to ask her is, how will you stay plugged in to the message? Where will you go to hear the message? What is the most important? The mess it's not your major. It's not where you live. It's not what you're eating physically. It's what Job says more than my day-to-day -day food. It's about what God is saying. It makes all the difference in my life. At the time when college students tell me this is when the temptations ramped up in my life, that's not the time in those storms to unplug from the foundation of Christ and his message. Not just college. Getting a new job, requiring a relocation, congratulations. Is it time to move? Yes, it might be. Who's your movers going to be? What's your new job going to entail? Uh, where are you going to go? Where are you going to live? Can you afford the house? What do you, how do you line it up? Does your spouse have to find a new job? Are you single? What are you going to do? How are you going to pack up? What are you going to do? Those are all questions. You know what the most important question is? Where you're going? Did God lead you there? And if he did, where will you stay plugged into the message? It's the most important. Are we a message-centered people with a God-centered message? I'm here to tell you, yes, we are. Yes, I'll, I will share the love of Christ with you. I will share the pieces that are, are wonderful and easy to hear, the hope that is in Christ. But you, you know what? I'm also charged with the responsibility to share with you the things you might not want to hear. Because God said it. All scripture is theonoustos. All scripture is God-breathed. He said it all. Don't you think that's important? Yes, we must put the message first. Yes, if we do not neglect the message, deception and the gaps will creep in, changing the truth of God into a lie. We must stay faithful and centered upon a, to become a message-centered people with a God-centered message. If so, we too will hear and do. We will dig and build. And we will see the vital need of the message and all its parts to equip us to do so. He will teach you here a little, there a little. All that you need to hear. I don't know, like for us to